we did not do a, a week ahead last week. I have a, an exceedingly abbreviated one. I, I will, I will let's, I'll narrow it down to the next few days ahead so as not to uh, uh, fail to meet expectations. Um, uh, tomorrow, the president will sign national service legislation passed by Congress uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, scheduled to attend uh, that event are uh, former President Bill Clinton uh, and Senator uh, Ted Kennedy, for whom the bill uh, is named. Senator? Yes. The President will present the Commander-in-Chief's trophy to the Naval, uh, Naval Academy football team at the White House. Uh, and the President will uh, also meet with King Abdullah of Jordan tomorrow. On Wednesday, the President will travel to, uh, and you guys should have this notice, travel to Newton, Iowa, where he will mark Earth Day uh, by highlighting how investments in clean energy technology uh, can boost the local economy uh, in communities large and small all across the nation. Uh, Thursday and Friday, he will have events here in D.C., but I do not have any more information on, the, on those events. And with that abbreviated look ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the 100 million target figure that mm -hmm. the President talked about today with the Cabinet, can you explain why so small? I know he talked about, you know, you add up 100 million, 100 million, 100 million, and eventually you get somewhere, but it would take an awfully long time to add up 100 million to make a dent in the deficit. Why not target a bigger number? Well, I think only in a, only in Washington, D.C. is a hundred million It's not a joke. No, I'm, I, the deficit's giant. A hundred million really is only no, a debt. Uh, but so no joke. joke about it, but it's I'm, not, I'm not making a joke about it. I'm being completely sincere mm -hmm. that only in Washington, D.C. is a hundred million dollars not a lot of money. It is where I'm from. It is where I grew up. And I think it is for hundreds of millions of Americans. Um, you were talking about an appropriations bill a few weeks ago about eight billion dollars being minuscule, eight billion in earmarks. We were talking about that, and you said that that well, in that terms of in a hundred million is a lot, but eight billion dollars. What is I'm small. saying is, I think it all adds up, just as the president said, just as Jennifer was good enough to do in her question. Uh, if you think we're going to get rid of a uh, 1.3 trillion dollar deficit by eliminating one thing, I'd be, and the administration would be. Uh, innumerably uh, happy for you to uh, let us know what that is. Because why not uh, try to get a bigger well, number me, so you can get a, explain, big, get a bigger let share? Let me explain sort deficit. of what has happened. Let's walk through this uh, so that everybody understands this. The President has laid out cuts, large and small, in, uh, in both the administrative costs and in the program costs of the federal budget. Some of the examples that the that we, were, we provided you all uh, will add up. For instance, the Department of Veterans Affairs either cancels or delays 26 conferences um, that can be better or more effectively and more cost effectively done by video conferencing that saves almost $18 million. A lot of these administrative things will add up. Uh, this is a short-term goal to come back with over the course of the next few weeks to identify further administrative savings that secretaries haven't already both identified and eliminated. Um, the President has also proposed savings on a much larger scale. Uh, the President has proposed ending the bank middleman for college loans, saving $94 billion over a 10-year period of time. The President has attacked in his budget the subsidies that we provide insurance companies to provide the same Medicare coverage, uh, private insurance companies, the same type of Medicare coverage that's already being offered at a savings of over $200 billion. Jennifer, the reason that the President can stand up with the backing of the Congressional Budget Office and talk about cutting the deficit in half over the course of four years' time is because there are cuts that are large student loans and Medicare Advantage, as well as small. This is the part of the President's promise and proposal to go line by line through the federal budget deficit. Will we enumerate programs that don't work that we're going to eliminate in the future? Yes. Uh, some of those cuts will be large, some of those cuts will be small. But 
we are not going to put ourselves back on a path toward fiscal sustainability if we don't look at each and every item in this federal budget uh, and make some of the cuts that are necessary to get us on that path. Yes, sir. On a, a whole different subject, um, at a uh, UN racism conference in Geneva today, uh, Iran's president uh, called Israel a racist regime. What's the administration's reaction to that, and um, could this in kind of rhetoric in, in any way undermine the president's attempt to, to reach out to uh, well, Iran? Uh, this is uh, uh, obviously it's uh, hateful rhetoric. It's um, uh, I think one of the reasons why you saw. Uh, the administration and the president determined that its participation in uh, this conference was uh, not a wise thing to do. Um, obviously, the president disagrees vehemently with what was said, as I, uh, from some of the video I saw, so did uh, many others. Um, we continue to have some, uh, we continue to evaluate our policy and understand that. Um, from a larger foreign policy framework, doing things uh, the same old way is not likely to bring about the change we need in our foreign policy. That's why the president uh, has, uh, in the message that was sent around New Year's, uh, engaged the Iranian people. Uh, and we clearly have, it's greatly in our national interest to see, uh, to do all that we can to prevent the Iranians uh, from developing a nuclear weapons program. But beyond words of condemnation, is there any action that the United States would take at the, you know, at, at the UN to well, the express UN, its uh, displeasure? Uh, well, uh, I, I think we've expressed our displeasure. Uh, I think that uh, we will continue to do so. Uh, the President, as, as you heard the President talk about yesterday, the President has sought and the United States will seek a seat on Council on uh, Human Rights. Uh, but. And I think the president and the administration obviously made the right decision in, uh, in not going forward with attendance at this conference, despite obviously a president that believes greatly that racism and intolerance uh, must be and should be addressed. Yes, sir. Robert, um, on the president's visit to the CIA today, mm -hmm. um, he took the extraordinary step of releasing these documents on alleged torture last week. Then people like General Hayden alleging that this makes America less safe. I know you and other administration officials obviously disagree with that point. But why run the risk of making America less safe in their eyes well, when you're not going to take the extra step of actually holding Bush administration officials well, accountable? Let's understand, first of all, the background of this, uh, Ed. There was a Freedom of Information Act case that uh, the legal team here and at other agencies were very convinced was not winnable. Um, that uh, there wasn't going to be a way uh, in any way, shape, or form to continue to hide these memos. I said this in response to a question, I believe, either Thursday or Friday. Um, What makes this country and ma what makes this country less safe is not the existence of enhanced interrogation techniques contained in a memo. It's that the world sees America and the values it holds up differently because it employed those techniques. Uh, the president, and I think what's most important to understand is the president of the United States in one of his very first acts as president, firmly banned the use of uh, enhanced interrogation techniques in dealing with prisoners. When you talk about America's image around the world, the president has talked a lot about that as well. What signal does it send the world if potentially people in the Bush administration, as far as potentially broke the law? This administration is now saying we're too busy. There's a lot on our plate. Obviously, no, this no, argument's no, no. been out there. Hold we're on. not going to. Uh, you said we can't look back. We want to look on. forward. Right, but it, what signals that? that? The, the administration didn't say they were too busy, Ed. The administration on the second day of a very busy day, in a very busy week, in a very busy 100 days, banned the technique. Right. Okay? I mean, so let, let's people understand. Broke the law hold before, on. Let's just turn no, no, the page. No, 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 no. Give me a chance to, to answer your multitude of questions. Question. I understand. I'm glad you've rephrased it. Um, the president took the extraordinary step of stopping these techniques from ever being used. Again, 
uh, as part of his administration. The president does believe, and the attorney general said quite clearly, that those that believed in good faith that these techniques had been declared legal by the Department of Justice uh, should not be prosecuted. Um, the president also believes that uh, rather than looking backward and fighting this backward, that it's important to move our country forward. Uh, that's what he signaled by banning the use of these techniques, uh, and that's where his focus is. So You're saying the people in the CIA who followed through on what they were told was legal, they should not be prosecuted, but why not the Bush administration lawyers well, again, who, in, in the eyes of a lot of your supporters on the left, twisted the law, why are they not well, being held accountable? The, the president is focused on looking forward. That's why. Yeah. Um, you just reiterated the president's comments that he won't, uh, that harsh interrogation techniques won't be used, but there is a Guantanamo detainee who's currently being detained who last week made a telephone call out of Guantanamo alleging that he is beaten almost on a daily basis and tear gas has been dumped on him. Uh, Mohammed El Karani. I, I haven't seen uh, something like that, but. Uh, 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 so I, I have no basis to answer the question. Jake. On Friday, um, the Obama administration was dealt a, a legal setback in another case in which it was arguing um, s the state secret mm -hmm. argument. Um, even though the judge was asking uh, the administration to comply with his order, that on only under very tight, uh, regulated way uh, would, the, would these documents be able to be shared uh, with the plaintiff's attorneys. I guess my question is, this is now the third time the administration has invoked state secrets, mm -hmm. uh, even though still on the campaign website and on the campaign trail, the president criticized the Bush administration for invoking it too often. Mm -hmm. What do you say to the people who voted for President Obama, uh, expecting a different take on the state secret argument based on what President Obama said on the campaign trail? who are disappointed with the fact that you guys keep invoking the same argument, in fact, in some cases, even taking it a step further. How taking it a step further? Uh, my understanding is in uh, not the case with the Islamic charity, uh, but in one of the other cases, there was uh, the administration uh, was asking for more uh, blanket authorization to invoke what they believe to be state secrets then. Well, I, I should familiarize myself with that particular instance uh, that I'm not aware of. The, the president uh, and the legal team here have uh, and will continue to evaluate um, and use in a judicious way uh, the notion of protecting state secrets and ensuring that uh, we balance the necessary need for transparency but also understanding that there are things that uh, can and should be protected uh, for national security reasons. To, from a to FISA go. judge, though, I mean, we're not talking about sharing it with, with you know, the front row here. We're talking about sharing it with a foreign <laughs> intelligence <laughs> judge. Or the, third, or the third row. Right. <laughs> Once you get much past the third, it's definitely downhill from there. Um, <laughs> come on, guys. It's Monday. You guys are a little punchy today. It's just a joke, all right? The second row has not been mentioned. <laughs> Just you wait. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, all right, this let's, is the yeah, judge we're talking right. about. Well, Sharon. look, again, we're, the, in each of these cases, the, the, the team and the president have to make a judgment based on, uh, based on national security. And let's build a little lot more. I want to bring in these OLC memos. Um, the president, as you guys have heard and read, the president thought about and struggled with this decision for quite some time, many weeks, uh, as the litigation uh, worked its way through the process, as extensions were needed and granted. Uh, the president weighed this argument of national security. Um, the one of the determinations that was made, as you heard the chief of staff make just this weekend, that uh, many of the techniques described in these memos have been widely written about. They were fairly, uh, uh, fairly detailed in their description in a recent New York Review of Books article. Uh, and in fact, in some of these instances, the own Bush administration declassified 
portions of these techniques uh, for transparency reasons. But in each of these situations, the legal team will weigh what is in the best interest of the national, uh, national security of the United States and balance it that with that needed transparency. I would, what I would tell either our supporters or our detractors uh, that the president understands the seriousness of both of those arguments uh, and will weigh each uh, to ensure that we're upholding uh, what protects this country uh, with what also underscores our values. Chip? Yeah, I want to ask about credit cards, but I first want to return to this uh, first topic. Uh, mm -hmm. You guys usually seem so in tune with uh, what the American people think and late night comedians and that kind of thing, it's hard to believe that $100 million won't become the butt of a whole lot of jokes. I mean, $100 million is four times what A Rod makes in a single year. It's, it's two thirds of what John Murtha, your mark <laughs> for a uh, single airport. Right. It is a tiny drop. Have in you guys the asked me about earmarks? It's, a, it's, a, it's an absurdly small amount of money. We've even talked about money. baseball here. Well, it's an amazingly you know, small amount of money, Robert. You've got Chip, to admit, I, I, bet, I mean, uh, how many stories? He's just hold to on. Be joked about. Well, let's let's joke a little about it. Um, how many stories do you think CBS or networks in this room did a few, maybe a decade or so ago, about six hundred dollar toilet seats to the Department of Defense? Now, how many people think the Department of Defense might buy enough six hundred dollar toilet seats to fix the 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 deficit or the debt? Well, I think that was a symbolic example of tens of billions of dollars being wasted. Uh, maybe you said it, uh, maybe uh, you hit on part of it, uh, but I also believe that cutting out $600 toilets, toilet seats is indicative of a culture that believes that's okay. It's indicative of a culture in this town that believes we can have 26 conferences that the VA should participate in, when in fact you can go into a room and get together on a video conference. Why not shoot higher? Aren't you confirming well, the critics who believe that when it comes to spending, the sky <laughs> is the limit for this administration, I, uh, but when it comes I'm to spending to, cuts... I'm happy to speak directly just, to our critics about how it is we got to where we are uh, with a $1.2, $1.3 trillion budget deficit and where the president wants to go by slashing that in half in four years. Well, and then up and up and up after those four uh, years. Well, it, we're making progress. We're cutting the budget deficit. We've outlined very specific savings. The Secretary of Defense has outlined very specific savings. Uh, we're happy to have uh, members and anybody else join in. My sense is this, Chip, that $100 million uh, may not be a lot to people in this town, uh, but I think it's a lot to people that live in this country. But on, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you. I think well, that most they, people will see it as a drop in the bucket, we, but uh, we'll see. If you put it, uh, trust me this, do me a favor and put it on the evening news tonight, and we'll judge it with the American people. How about that? Favor. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. I'll see you. <laughs> <laughs> right. on, on credit cards. Uh, I've week. just canceled the week ahead, and uh, we're done. On credit cards, uh, Larry Suppers said uh, over the weekend that uh, the president's going to be focusing on a whole bunch of issues uh, having to do with credit card abuse, yeah. and that people have been deceived into paying extraordinarily high rates they wouldn't have paid if they knew what they were getting themselves into. Number one, can you give us any kind of preview of what's coming? And secondly, how upset, how frustrated, how angry is the president that some of these companies are getting uh, federal money and then they're sticking it to consumers? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you could... Uh, rightly construe that some of the action that the president and the administration want to take on this um, are partly because of that. But at the same time, the president has uh, a fairly lengthy record, including in the campaign, of discussing some of the deceptive practices that are involved, some of the outrageous fees that are charged um, uh, on particular actions involving credit cards. And the president talked about, in the campaign, a credit card bill of rights uh, that had a number of different things, and we can make sure that you all have that. Uh, but it banned certain fees. Uh, I think the example that we used uh, on that day was, um, you know, you, you can get charged interest based on what you sign up for on the credit card on those fees. Um, that 
as, as uh, Dr. Summer said, there will be a focus on um, some of the de deceptive practices that trap people into uh, a credit card rate uh, despite the unsustainability of that. Um, that if, uh, and we talked about the idea of having a rating system so that you, so that people would know exactly what they were getting. I think everybody has seen, if you get one of these, and you probably get one of these in the mail uh, every week, you turn it over on the back and it's, it's writing that you wouldn't even have your eye doctor use in your eye test, uh, that enumerates all these different rules and regulations, some of which change over time. Um, the president believes that we can increase transparency involved, cut down on these deceptive practices, and ensure that um, this, any system that is involving fees is done in a way that is fair. Is he angry that bailed out companies are now doing this to people? Well, I, I don't think the anger just is for bailed out companies. I mean, there are companies that aren't getting money from the federal government that are involved in uh, practices where people see their credit card rates skyrocket unbeknownst to them or contained in paragraph 14 of uh, some very small writing at the very end of uh, a credit card contract. Uh, but this is all part of, uh, of an agenda uh, to make and protect the middle class, uh, to make, uh, to take a look directly at some of these practices and uh, make it a little bit more honest and a little bit more fair. On, on credit cards, on the Thursday meeting um, with the executive, what's what's the president looking for? Is this a, does he want a mea culpa? Is it, is it like the bank executives where he help me, help you? What's the goal? Well, no, I, I, I think there are a couple of different goals. I mean, obviously you've got, obviously there are, um, there are uh, meaningful uses for credit, obviously, in this economy. Uh, what we want to do is ensure that people can have access to the credit that they need, but that we can also do this in a way, as I just mentioned, that's transparent and fair and honest. And I think that's what the president, one of the things that the president will talk to them about. Back to the OLC memos for a second. You said something a minute ago I don't think I've heard before, which is that your lawyers concluded that um, it was a, a losing argument to try to argue for not disclosing the memos, which just makes me wonder, did you release the memos because you concluded you didn't have a winning argument or because the president felt it was the right thing to do in terms of disclosure? Uh, the president, because his administration had previously pledged to release them based on the fact that it was the right thing to do. What I, what I was saying, though, is that this sort of straw man argument propped up by other people as if there wasn't an impetus for having to do this anyway. Um, even if uh, you could envision a, a, a different administration in charge or at a different period of time, and the court was likely to compel whoever that was to make those documents public. Okay, back to on um, Friday night, as you're probably well aware, the president was. Um, criticized a lot recently for essentially not responding on the merits to what uh, the Nicaraguan president said at that dinner on Friday night. Do you think the president should have been more forceful in his response or even just responded on the merits as opposed to I guess I suppose joke? he could have asked for equal time, but we'd probably still be there. Um, I, I think the president made clear throughout the weekend uh, what he agrees with uh, with the leaders of a very important region of our world and, and the very specific things that he doesn't agree with. Some people felt like it demanded a response. Well, uh, I think the president, uh, uh, the president said yesterday and the president said throughout the weekend that there are, are uh, many things that he doesn't agree with. Again, uh, the man spoke for 53 minutes. <laughs> My guess is if you didn't ask a question in the intervening 53 minutes, one might feel the need to uh, come up and want to say something about me. <laughs> but uh, I think the president laid out a very uh, forceful argument over the course of the weekend about why uh, we have to change the foreign policy that we have in this country. I think he did it uh, in actions uh, and also put the onus, I think, on many leaders in the hemisphere um, 
to back up their rhetoric and their words with specific deeds. There's nothing that stops uh, anybody at that conference from delivering change in their society. Uh, and I think the president was, uh, was forceful in doing that. John. I'd like to ask about Roxana Saveri and um, two other journalists being held in North Korea. What specific <coughs> steps, if any, are being taken by the administration to try to get these journalists free? And what impact might these arrests have on uh, planned talks uh, or outreach to, to both of these countries? Well, Jonathan, I, 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 in all honesty, I'm not going to add a whole lot to what the president said in his, uh, I think, pretty clear uh, answer to this yesterday. That uh, uh, certainly in the the instance of uh, of the journalist in Iran, that we believe that she was uh, wrongly accused and wrongly convicted. Uh, that we're deeply disappointed that. Um, that the government would undertake the actions that they did and that we will continue to work with uh, our partners uh, to convey the concern and disappointment that we have. But what, what impact, I mean, we, there, was, there were movements toward uh, possible yeah, resumption I'm, of the five-party talks, things like that. I would, uh, I would point you to the President's answer and just not get uh, a whole lot past that. Yes, sir. Thank you, Robert. On Friday afternoon, the Associated Press reported, and this is a quote, the family of the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. has charged the foundation that's building a King monument in the National Mall about $800,000 for the use of his words and image. And my question, first, of, first part of two, first part of, of Let's tread lightly here, Lester. This. Since historian David Garrow Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Dr. King was reported by AP to have been, quote, absolutely scandalized by the profiteering behavior of King's children. What was the President's reaction to this AP report? I, I don't take this to mean anything about the Associated Press, uh, but I am unfamiliar if the President has seen that report and neither have I. Well, uh, since the, this news was also reported by the New York Times, Oh, now. <laughs> I see we're on the second row now, Lester. <laughs> what is your reaction as the president's press secretary? I, I, I would, uh, uh, I was in Trinidad this weekend. I didn't have handy my copy of the New York Times, and I, I didn't read this on the AP wire. Uh, so I will. Uh, but you will look into it, won't you? I, put that microphone. I will endeavor to check. Yes, sir. <laughs> Robert, uh, near the end of uh, the president's cabinet meeting, he made reference to a confidence gap on the deficit. I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on what he meant by that. Uh, do you have any more? I wasn't in for that part of. Uh, it seemed like a passing reference to that he realizes there's a confidence gap with the American people on the issue of the deficit. Well, I think the the president has certainly talked before about he knows uh, and the American people know that continuing to run up deficits, to use a term as far as the eye can see, uh, and continue to have those expand for years and years and years is unsustainable. That's exactly why the President uh, submitted a budget that cuts the deficit in half over the course of four years. Despite much derision, that's why the president is seeking cuts, both large and small. Uh, we have to give confidence to the American people that we can spend any money that we uh, ask to spend uh, wisely. That's why the president has um, undertaken greater transparency as it relates to spending and the stimulus. Uh, and I think. The president overall wants to give the American people uh, assurance that uh, the government can use the money uh, from them wisely. Follow up to what Savannah was asking earlier. Um, coming off a second foreign trip, uh, criticism has been buzzing by some of the president's critics. What do you make of the criticism? And do you worry, or does he worry at all, that somebody like Hugo Chavez has more to gain by being seen with him uh, then obviously he has to gain. Well, uh, this isn't about what any person has to gain. This is about what a country has to gain. And let's 
do this in a little bit of a broader way. And the president talked about this some yesterday. The president uh, ran on a policy of changing the way we conduct our foreign policy. And I think the principal examples that he used throughout the campaign um, were that over the course of many years, we'd seen the North Koreans uh, gain access to enough material to build six to ten more nuclear weapons. That over the course of several years, the country of Iran had gone from zero centrifuges to thousands of centrifuges. That we had taken our eye off the ball in Afghanistan. Um, and that certain people in the hemisphere were leading uh, a very anti-American, uh, using very anti-American rhetoric um, to, in many ways, destabilize the region. That's what he saw as specific policies that needed to be changed in order to further our national interest. Look at what we got just simply out of this weekend. Two years ago, Hugo Chavez kicked our ambassador out of Caracas. Nothing, wanted nothing to do with uh, being a responsible part of a community of nations. Now engaging in the world, uh, the Venezuelans have, a, as I understand it, put names forward uh, to put an ambassador back in place here. Uh, and uh, as the president said, the Department of State will follow suit in order to do the same thing there. We have a strong national interest in a region that is stable and secure, a region of the world that doesn't see a rise in corruption or drug violence, uh, and a stable part of the world that can be an important economic trading partner with the United States of America. That's what the President saw in the lead up to these trips, and that's the exact, uh, that's exactly what he's been doing uh, in each of these two trips to further not any one person's interest, but to, um, to further the interest of the United States. And one also just has to look at the pictures that were associated with the most previous summit of the Americas. Is it in our national interest to have images going all over the world of thousands of protesters burning in effigy some look-alike of the American government? I don't think that furthers our national interest. The president doesn't think that furthers our national interest. And engaging in the world stage uh, does further our national interest, make us safer and more secure uh, by creating uh, stability in this important region of the world. Mike. Hey, Robert, given the value the administration sees in engaging people who have opposing points of view, why not then send a, a delegation to the UN Conference on Race, even if the odious things being said, why not go there and, and oppose it? Well, we did send a delegation in the lead up to the conference. In t I think it was in 2001, a similar conference, I think it's 2001, 2002, a similar conference uh, released a very at the conclusion released a document that contained things that the previous administration didn't agree with and that this administration didn't agree with. We set out very specific conditions and sent a high-level team to see if the conference was serious about the issue of racism and intolerance rather than to be part of political propaganda after working to try to address those uh, shortcomings, uh, the administration decided uh, that it could not and should not be a part of uh, what we saw happening today. This president believes very strongly in dealing with racism and intolerance. Um, but uh, I don't think it was in our national interest to be part of uh, 
the conference that's going on right now. Was the objection to something in the conference document or just the overall tenor of? Uh, well, I think both. Uh, I think you've seen it already today, but I think you've also seen uh, in the documents that were, were forthcoming, and we can get you some enumeration of this. A lot of it was predicated on what was originally objectionable several years ago. Uh, that if the conference was truly focused on doing this in an important way, uh, it would have uh, made some of those changes. I, I would point you also to um, a f far more eloquent answer that the President gave on this topic yesterday. Sure. Robert, two questions of foreign and a domestic. First, of foreign, can you just share with us a little bit about the president's agenda in his meeting with King Abdullah, uh, Middle East peace, oil prices? I don't know what's and and have they met before? Uh, yes, they uh, they've I know they've talked on the phone uh, since being inaugurated. Obviously, have they met in person? yes, the president uh, uh, spent some time uh, with the king last year on our trip to Jordan. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the Secret Service thought of it, but uh, when the king drove the uh, then senator to the uh, the airport uh, uh, in his car, I, uh, I I remember it being a a, a, a fun drive, uh, <laughs> probably for both. Um, I think the biggest topic, obviously, is going to be um, the Middle East peace process and. Uh, uh, where we are in that, the President has promised to be uh, engaged repeatedly uh, in ensuring uh, a lasting peace there, and, and that will um, almost certainly be the dominant topic, and we'll have a, a readout from that afterwards. Can I, can I put on that? Hold on, hold on one second. Do, Let me get to the want, domestic well, question. Well, let's get to the domestic question, and then I'll, if we could follow up on sure, the because sure. I think a lot of people want to know. On the domestic side, just again to draw you out on this $100 billion, when the when Republicans were criticizing earmarks and also uh, provisions in the stimulus bill like the contraceptives, the President repeatedly returned to the theme that this was a small amount of the overall package. And I don't see how it cannot be construed as a double standard to have him say, well, that's a small amount, but this $100 million that I'm saving, that's really important. How well, is that not a double standard? Well, let's not also mix apples and oranges here, because the point that we were making was that whatever that amount is, it shouldn't stand in the way of an even greater uh, commitment to help our economy uh, recover and to invest in the things that the President believed were important for long-term growth. What about on the earmarks, though? The earmarks was same the same. Thing. No, was he was saying, look, this isn't a big deal. It's just a small part of this overall big bill, and why, why hang it up over something small? Well, and I think we covered many of those arguments at the time. We also were dealing with uh, last year's omnibus appropriations bill. Um, again, the, we're going to have to make cuts in programs that don't work. We're going to have to find administrative savings where previously people didn't think there were savings. We're going to have to look at programs, big and small, in order to get this country back on a path toward fiscal sustainability. We're not going to do it with one thing. It's going to be many, many things over the course of many, many years that gets us back on the road to fiscal sanity, whether it's a $600 toilet seat or whether it's the mindset that believes that the old way of doing business is perfectly acceptable, that's exactly what this president was elected to challenge, and that's exactly what he's done. But are there enough $600 toilet seats? And even, you're not talking $600 toilet seats, you're talking... No, I'm talking $100 million toilet no, seats. Talking I'm talking about the great $100 million dollar toilet seats. share, you know, printers or uh, publishing <laughs> judicial forfeiture notices on the Internet instead of in uh, newspapers. Well, maybe that maybe we've touched on a maybe we've touched on a far more uh, touchy subject, so to speak, uh, as uh, what transparency means in the age of uh, newspaper revenue. Um, I don't think we're getting enough revenue from your traditional uh, Well, well, uh, change you can believe in, Cheryl. How can you? No, I don't think they're small things. I, I I don't know what the savings in 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 the stuff that we put out equals up to, um, but. Uh, Several hundred million dollars is important. The president's going to challenge the cabinet to uh, not just stop here, 
Cheryl, if I were to stand up here and tell you that if we eliminate $100 million, we could all take off at 4 o'clock every day because our, our, our problems have all been solved, then I'm, I'm free to be ridiculed. This is one in a series of steps that the President believes is important to take, not just to identify savings, but to attack a culture that believes we can't change the way this place works in order to put us on that pathway to fiscal sustainability, Edward. that we can't uh, find programs that don't work and should be eliminated, that we can't go line by line through the federal budget and look for savings big and small, whether it's $100 million in administrative costs or $200 billion uh, to give to private insurance companies to play middleman on Medicare, or $94 billion to give banks to play middleman on student loans. The president is going to look for savings great and small uh, wherever he can find it in order to put our country back on the path toward fiscal sustainability. Right. Do you want to follow up on, on the Jordan meeting yeah. with the King tomorrow? Is, is this meeting uh, prelude to a more personal uh, involvement uh, from the, the part of the president in the region? Uh, in particular, Israeli sources say that uh, the prime minister uh, will be here uh, around the uh, May the 18th. Can you confirm that there will be I, such a I, I would have to talk to scheduling uh, specifically about uh, an upcoming meeting uh, with the prime minister. I can assure you that uh, if the Prime Minister is, uh, is here, uh, the President would be anxious to uh, sit down and talk with him as he sat down and talked with him uh, last year about this and other subjects that relate to our security. Robert, just to, um, I have a question on the uh, fiscal question and also CIA. In every speech, including last Tuesday, the President talks about how serious he is about entitlement reform. And he says, you know, obviously no matter how many small cuts you make, or however important they are symbolically, we're not going to be on a path to fiscal sustainability without entitlement reform. And can you just tell us where that effort stands right now? I mean, when does it start? Is he looking at a commission? 80 or I so mean, days ago. Pardon? 80 or so days ago. On yeah. And what, what do you mean? I mean well, I, I, I think taking $200 billion of waste out of Medicare is entitlement reform. Now, again, maybe $200 billion isn't a lot of money here either. Well, no, well okay, <laughs> but what the, what the President says he wants to do entitlement reform, like he's talked about last Tuesday, he seems to suggest something was coming in the future, not that. So is he talking about a commission? What well, does he have in mind for, uh, for big str to, yeah. to attack the well, structural deficits? Cutting $200 yeah. million out of Medicare is a great start, but that's not what he. Look, that's that's I mean, a, that's, awesome. He talks awesome. about enti uh, entitlement reform. I feel like we're like this little charity that we meet that red mark where we finally exceeded the thermometer. Um, the president, I think, has spoken particularly about um, Medicare uh, restructuring, uh, particularly as it relates to health care reform. Um, that. We are not going to be able, if, if, if we're unable to address the rising costs of health care through Medicare, that the structural deficit that you talk about is not likely to ever become something that we can control. That's why the President sought $200 billion in savings uh, from the middlemen involved in the Medicare Advantage program. And that's why he believes that health care reform is so important to address skyrocketing and spiraling costs. I don't want to get ahead of where the President might be on other topics and other entitlements, um, but the President is very serious about uh, making a dent in, uh, a serious dent in the way uh, our government does business and the way it spends taxpayer money. Just to, on the CIA. You said that you released these documents for two reasons. One, because it was the right thing to do, but also because you wouldn't have had any legal alternative. Well, I um, mentioned that as uh, a backdrop for the situation. Yeah. That but, the notion that I think it's important for everyone to understand that there was a pending court case that involved Freedom of Information Act, a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit involving that had been ongoing involving this government and an interest group for access to these documents. My question is, why are you and your lawyers confident that by releasing these documents you don't undermine your position in future cases when you are going to invoke the State Secrecy well, Act? Well, uh, I mean, 
without getting into detail, I can assure you that that was something that was thought through uh, prior to any recommendation uh, based on either past, current, or future uh, litigation. John? My question follows on that, actually. Uh, when you said that the uh, legal counsel's office felt this was unwinnable, uh, the FOIA case, are you referring to the release of the memos was? I'm, I'm referring to the notion that at some point uh, right. legal, uh, a legal entity would have compelled um, the making public of the very documents that were made public. But the, but the question is, were you unable to keep the memos? Uh, okay, you, you obviously felt that you couldn't keep the memos back, but um, what, legal, term, what yeah. legal obligation did you have to uh, allow as much information in the memos to be public because um, you certainly, it seems, could have redacted more under the, the State Secrets Act. Well, that's not entirely, um, I, let me get Justice to speak on this because in all honesty, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there may well still be litigation involving uh, any redaction that was done. Um, uh, that's in some ways an ongoing part of the case that these memos were involved in. The case I hear you making is that the, the counsel's office felt like it was unwinnable in order in well, terms of keeping the memos in that, total again, back. That's to give you some background by which uh, and backdrop for which this case existed. The Attorney General during his confirmation hearings made clear that uh, the administration believed it was important um, to make these memos uh, public. Margaret? Uh, a credit card follow-up question. I wasn't entirely clear with the previous two questions about whether the aim in sitting down with these lending folks is to get them to voluntarily agree to uh, scale back some of these fees or, or do a rating system or some of the stuff or whether to tell them we're doing a bill and we want you to sign on. Um, what strategically, what are you, are you well, hoping I don't to get, get ahead of where the what what argument that the administration will make to uh, uh, except to say yes. Uh, obviously, if uh, the administration and I think the public in general would be happy if some of the practices that they and others find offensive or ended would be a good step in the right direction. That I don't doubt. Um, uh, but at the same time, I think Dr. Summers and others spoke this weekend about pursuing uh, a course through Congress uh, that would provide fairness and transparency uh, to this process. But presumably, in, in, in having them there and bringing them out very public, at least in the meeting, the fact of the meeting being public, there must be some... Um, perhaps a policy goal in addition to just the public relations goal. Can you, can well, you talk about that? I mean, the meeting is not for public relations. Um, uh, the meeting is to have a serious conversation about uh, the economy. Uh, we've talked a lot in this room, and, and, and you all have in your reporting about the importance of, uh, of credit and getting it moving again, <laughs> but we also want to do ensure that that's done in a way that doesn't, uh, as the President has spoken about, provide um, simply another uh, bubble and bust scenario whereby uh, people are over leveraged or maxed out on their credit cards uh, to the point where uh, they are carrying an unsustainable debt uh, and a burden that they uh, can't get away from. Meeting a do-it-yourself or else kind of meeting? No, I, I, like what you were saying. No, I, 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 do I think those topics will come up? Yes. I, I have no way of judging three days before the meeting the posture that certain people will take in the meeting. That's why we'll read it out when we get there. Oh. Who's coming? Uh, I don't have a list in front of me. Yes, ma'am. With 10 days left to go, is the White House prepared to let Chrysler go bankrupt if uh, it can't reach a deal with Fiat? Um, the, the President's Auto Task Force uh, is continuing to work with all of the stakeholders involved uh, to uh, find a solution, uh, we hope, that continues uh, 
the Chrysler brand and strengthens the auto industry. Uh, we believe that uh, we believe that's we believe that was possible 20 days ago, uh, and we certainly believe that uh, is possible, as you mentioned, with about 10 days to go in this process. Even if the deal isn't reached with Fiat. With Fiat? Well, I don't want to 10 days before it prejudge where it might end up, uh, but the president continues to be uh, involved in this issue uh, and understanding the tremendous economic importance both for uh, the overall industry and for the uh, dozens of communities throughout the country uh, that are dependent upon uh, uh, Chrysler and, and auto parts suppliers that supply Chrysler uh, for uh, good paying jobs uh, that the president believes are tremendously important and can't and shouldn't be lost. Thank you. Thanks, guys.